Extreme Rules, the horror show at Extreme Rules. Extreme Rules, the horror show, whatever it is called. It's gone through so many iterations at this point, hasn't it? I believe they have settled on the horror show at Extreme Rules. That's what they've been calling it recently on Raw and SmackDown. So we'll go with the horror show at Extreme Rules. This is going to be your Extreme Rules, the horror show at Extreme Rules, whatever they're calling it preview and predictions video we're going to run through the card i'll give my predictions and a preview a little bit on the matches uh, we are going to be doing a extreme rules watch along tonight we did our first watch along last night uh, for slammiversary thank you for everyone that's tuned in um had a lot of fun interacting with all of you guys uh managed to gain some new subscribers as well uh, and just enjoying watching some wrestling so that's exactly what we're going to be doing tonight for extreme rules so I'll put a, uh, a link in the description box so you can set a reminder there and we'll be putting it on, out on social media as well. Probably go live about 15 minutes before the show starts or something around then. Um, but yeah, be sure to join us for that tonight also. Uh, so we'll go through the card. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to take place live uh, like any show at the moment with WWE from the WWE Performance Center apart from... The Wyatt Swamp fight, which was recorded uh, earlier this week. That will be our cinematic presentation for the evening. Uh, in terms of overall the card, it's um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because how much hype is there uh, about this one? And, and, I, and I'm not really sure because I find it interesting that we're having matches cut from this card and moved to Raw and SmackDown. So we're going to have Randy Orton versus The Big Show Monday Night on Raw, which is an unsanctioned match, which you would think is a match befitting for Extreme Rules. Obviously, it's got the unsanctioned stipulation as well, but Raw is dying a death when it comes to live viewers, so they're trying to do anything they can to get people actually watching the show at all because nobody's watching the show. You've got Sheamus versus Jeff Hardy on SmackDown next week in a bar fight which is i mean the most extreme rules of extreme rules stipulation that you could think it's a, another gimmick match uh but no that's not happening uh but on extreme rules on this extreme rules card we've got three matches that don't have any stipulations in which to me defeats the purpose now i'm not saying every match at extreme rules does it have to have a stipulation no but if you're selling the pay-per-view, the gimmick of the pay-per-view is uh, that it's going to have stipulations, then why why doesn't every match have them? Me personally, and this is my opinion when it comes to all of this, I would rather them not have gimmick pay-per-views. Why can't they just do it like they used to back in the day? Whether it is Bad Blood, whether it is Judgment Day, whether it is No Way Out, whether it is Vengeance, The Great American Bash, Bad Blood. Why can't they just have it like that? Why does every pay-per-view have to have a theme, have to have a gimmick? Uh, and I think the reason, if I was going to answer my own question there, the reason every pay-per-view has to have a theme or a gimmick is because less and less people watch them at the moment and it gets more people watching. It's, it's my biggest problem with the likes of the Elimination Chamber and Hell in the South pay-per-views. It's just completely ruined that match type for me because they were matches saved for feuds or for big pay-per-views that really deserved them and that's not the case now. And it's, it goes the same with this one. Uh, we've got tables matches and uh, etc. on this show. Would they be usually saved for something a bit special for a feud? But it's kind of like, well, it's the gimmick pay-per-view. We need to do a gimmick. And I don't think it should work that way. Um, but the matches look solid. I, if anything, I am glad that they're cutting down the matches slightly because it would have made it a really long show. And when these WWE shows are long, sometimes it can be quite difficult to watch. But... Um, We'll get into what I think will be the what I think should be the main event, but what I think will be the main event, uh, and we'll touch on all of that uh, in the predictions. So first up, we have a tables match for the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Championship. We have the New Day, Big E, and Kofi Kingston defending against Shizaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. This has been one of those tag team feuds, which is uh, which is always frustrates me because it's one of those feuds where. Going a couple of weeks ago, Cesaro and Nakamura probably weren't deserving of winning, of, of having a tag team championship match, but they beat the New Day a couple of times and that's how they justify the tag team match. Surely having a good feud should be that the challenges have been built up over time by defeating everyone else and then it's they've got over to the champions, let's see what happens, the champions and the challengers face off for the first time. For one of me, it's one of my big pet peeves of having... Uh, challenges beat champions over and over and over again because you know once you get to the pay-per-view here that um the champ the challenges aren't going to win because they've won it they've lost so many times on tv it's wwe's backwards booking when it comes to that one 
It is nice, of course, to have Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura actually be featured on WWE television and have something uh, meaningful to do. And to be honest, maybe saying featured is not the right word there because Nakamura and Cesaro, during this whole era at the moment, they've been featured on SmackDown every single week. But just because they're in matches, just because they're doing stuff, doesn't mean they have some re- something really substantial to do. You look at Shinsuke Nakamura. I mean, this tag team, they're talking about how underutilized they are, which is WWE just admitting that they don't know what to do with them and haven't done well well by them. Shinsuke Nakamura won the Royal Rumble. You go back to his debut after WrestleMania 33. I, I defy anyone to be get a reception like that. They had they started to call him the rock star and all that sort of stuff, but he had he had momentum and he had popularity, and they've just once again, it's the typical NXT to WWE story, isn't it? They just they've completely killed him. They've completely killed him. Um, once he gets to the main roster, they have to they have to tweak him. They have to change him because whatever he was doing in NXT wasn't right. It isn't good enough. He can't just be Shinsuke Nakamura. He has to be known as the rock star Shinsuke Nakamura or the artist known as Shinsuke Nakamura or the artist formerly known as Shinsuke Nakamura. And they have to tweak all of this sort of stuff because it, that isn't WWE. They haven't done. That's not their invention. And I think that's the most annoying thing when it comes to Nakamura is what he could have been versus what he is now. And people will say, well, he did he did get a push, you know, for a year. He did. He beat John Cena on SmackDown, dropped him straight on his head, uh, won the Royal Rumble. And yeah, he did. I think the biggest problem with Nakamura was he had that feud with Jinder Mahal for the WWE Championship back in 2017. And he lost. He, he just he didn't win. And it was kind of, OK, where would you go from there? He does win the Royal Rumble. But then after that match of AJ Styles at WrestleMania, the dream match that just didn't deliver... Unfortunately, it just hasn't been the same for Nakamura since, and that, and that is a shame. Cesaro, I mean, what needs to be said about Cesaro when it comes to being underutilized? One of the best workers in WWE. Um, I don't think Cesaro can have a bad match. Every Cesaro match is either a, at a minimum good. Um, but recently on SmackDown, his matches with the likes of Big E, he had a match with Big E Friday night on SmackDown, I thought was great. And... Um, Cesaro is just a phenomenal worker. He's a phenomenal worker. It doesn't need to be said. Maybe that's the problem. It's the expectation that he is good and he's a good solid for what he does on the roster. Um, in terms of the stipulation for this one, I didn't really, I didn't really get this on SmackDown this past week. So for the last few weeks, when Cesaro and Nakamura have been facing off against the New Day, uh, they brought out the tables. In fact, we had a SmackDown Tag Team Championship match a couple of weeks ago on SmackDown in the main event, which ended in a no contest or double disqualification, which, of course, is a finish I absolutely despise. Um, And then after the match, Cesaro and Nakamura bring out a table, and you think, right, well, they're going to do a rematch at Extreme Rules, and it's going to be a table match. And then the following week on SmackDown, they go, uh, okay, we're going to have a match between Cesaro and Big E, and the winner is going to decide the stipulation here. And it was some form of... Two of uh, WWE sponsored had voted earlier on in the year between stipulations, and it was one was a table match and one was a steel cage match. But they went, but the vote was too close to call, so we're going to give it to the winner of the this match. And that that logic just baffled me, because how can a vote be too close to call unless it's a dead tie? which they didn't say that's what it was. They called the match a tiebreaker, but they didn't say the vote was a tie because it obviously wasn't. But you don't have votes. You don't have an election, and then you go, oh, we're going to have to, we'll, we'll do it again. It was too close to call. You only won by about five votes, but yeah, does that really count as a win? No, that's not how a vote works. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So, And then after the match, Cesaro wins, and then shock, shock horror, shock horror, the horror show at Extreme Rules, uh, they say it's going to be a table match. Well, obviously, they got the tables out a couple of weeks ago on SmackDown. So I guess it was just it was just filling the time for the story of that one, I guess. But we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, in terms of a prediction, I think the New Day will retain here. Uh, I'd like to see Cesaro and Nakamura win the titles, and I don't think it's um, a given that they won't. Um, I just don't see the, the New Day dropping the titles anytime soon. I will say that I think the SmackDown tag team division is very lax. It doesn't really fill me with too much excitement it feels like we've seen the same combinations quite often obviously we don't have the forgotten sons on tv anymore um they didn't do it for me anyway but miz and morrison don't look to be super super involved in tag team matches at the moment the usos are out that tag team division is suffering and uh, to be honest this tag team wrestling in wwe is suffering really with the way that they take it seriously 
they don't take it seriously rather. I would like to see the Viking Raiders moved over to SmackDown. I think they'd be a good addition and having a Viking Raiders feud with the New Day or Viking Raiders versus Cesaro and Nakamura would be be good matches and good fun to watch and would certainly give the division the energy that it needs. Next up, we have a singles match for the WWE United States Championship. Apollo Crews, the WWE United States Champion, defends against MVP. Now, MVP recently on Raw has revealed the new WWE United States Championship. Apollo Crews went down with an injury. You can't see me, but I'm doing the finger quotation marks. Apollo Crews went down with an injury a few weeks ago on Raw. I believe it was a knee injury or something like that. Uh, and subsequently, MVP has uh, announced that he is the new United States Champion reintroduced um, or introduced a new WWE United States Championship rather um, which drew a mixed response on social media. I did do a, a video about it on the channel so be sure to check that out. In terms of my opinion on the United States Championship and I said this at the time so I'm not backtracking when I say this. I said at the time that I think the title would grow on me and, and it has. It has grown on me. I don't think it's better than the, the championship that they had. There are certainly elements to it that I would change, um, whether it's uh, for a championship that is a United States championship, there is a distinct lack of blue on there. I think someone on uh, posted on Twitter a sort of remade version of it, and they put a lot of blue at the top with the, with the stars, and it immediately looked a lot better. Uh, I don't understand why the champion is so large on the title either. To me, Surely the the big part, or if you're going to use big font there, it should be the United States, not the champion. That doesn't make any sense. And I'd rather have the eagle be prominent in the middle, in the center of the title, rather than at the bottom. Maybe the eagle one's nitpicking, but look, I don't think it's a bad championship at all. Um, I don't think it's hideous. I don't think it's horrible. I've softened on it. I, like I said, I, it is growing on me, and a couple of weeks later, it's 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 okay. It's okay, and look, these things have to change. I'm surprised that it took 17 years for them to redesign the US Championship in the first place, so um, it, it's growing on me in terms of the championship design. MVP, though, he is just synonymous with the United States Championship when it comes to WWE, isn't he? Uh, at one point, he was the longest reigning uh, WWE United States Champion of all time. I think he held the title close to a year. Dean Ambrose, of course, is the longest reigning US champion in WWE history, but MVP, I believe, is a is either second or third. He's very, very close with that. Uh, he also, this is a little bit of a forgotten fact that people might not be aware of or uh, may have forgotten. He, When he became the longest reigning United States champion in WWE history at the time, he was actually given a United States championship ring uh, on Friday Night Smackdown back in, this must have been 2007, I think it might have been 2007, um, or 2006, probably 2007, he was given a United States Championship ring, which if you Google it looks awesome, it's like, it looks a bit like the John Cena customised US Championship, uh, but just on the ring, and it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool, we posted that out and MVP retweeted it, I'd like to see him bring back the ring, that would be pretty, pretty badass, wouldn't it? In terms of who do I think will win this match, I think Apollo Crews retains here. I don't see any reason for him to drop the title so quickly. If he does drop the title to MVP here, I think it's uh, pretty obvious that the Apollo Crews uh, experiment might be over already, but I don't think that that's the case. Uh, I expect him to come out with the old US Championship, defeat MVP, and then claim the new one. That'll be the official retirement of the old US Championship and the... Uh, the new champion having the new championship. Obviously, Bobby Lashley's going to be with MVP, uh, but I don't think a loss doesn't hurt MVP at this point in his career. He's been losing to Apollo Crews and losing to everyone, really. Obviously, he's got a couple of matches, one recently on Raw, but that's just to hype him up for this match. I don't think he's going to win here, um, but he's doing a great job. Is there anyone that's had a better 2020 than MVP? You could only count him on, on one hand, really. Uh, I, I really think so. You probably have to look at the likes of Randy Orton and... Uh, Oscar, Sasha Banks and Bailey that have probably had a better 2020 than MVP because no one saw MVP's return coming. Came back, surprise entrant Royal Rumble, has his retirement match on Raw the following night, becomes a producer, becomes an on-screen character, then returns to the ring and now he's competing for the United States Championship at Extreme Rules and has introduced a brand new United States Championship. Not bad for a guy that was retired back in January. But I think Apollo Crews uh, leaves this one as United States Champion. Next up, we have the Rey Mysterio versus Seth Rollins eye for an eye match. Now, for those who are not aware of this eye for an eye match, the match can only be won when one competitor extracts an eye of their opponent. Yes, you heard me correctly there. Extracts an eye of their opponent. 
I've spoken about this at length on the channel here, so I won't go into too much detail. But it's, it's, this is, this is, to be honest, along with the White Swamp fight, this is something I am looking forward to on this show because I am so morbidly curious as to how they're going to pull this off and if it's going to be bad, if they manage to pull it off at all, or if it is just a disaster. So we've heard reports that the finish here is going to be the match, by all accounts, I don't know if it has been taped or. Um, we'll have to wait and see. We'll find out later on, I suppose. But the rumour was that the match was going to be uh, taped and we were going to have some form of a CGI-style finish. Because, look, the only way to win the match, one of the competitors needs to be holding the other competitor's eye in their hand. It has to be removed from their head, from their skull, to win this match. So the rumour was that CGI was going to be involved. I don't know if WWE and CGI is a good combination um again i don't know if this is going to be happening live as well or if this is going to be has been recorded already if it hasn't been recorded i don't know how the cgi element of that is truly going to work um if it, even if it was pre-recorded a week ago that means you've only got a week to make the cgi look realistic and actually make it look like an eye is in their hand and cgi good cgi takes time you go to Corridor Digital here on YouTube, Corridor Crew, you see the inner workings of a uh, computer-generated imagery uh, company and how stressful that is and how long it takes and how expensive, expensive it is. Uh, and it, it takes time. It takes time. And bad CGI takes you out of a movie, right? Everyone, Everyone's seen movies where they're looking at something that is CGI and they just go, man, that is, that is terrible. It's obviously not real. It doesn't look good. And it just takes you out of it. And that's my concern for this match is we could have a absolutely spectacular match between Rey Mysterio and Seth Rollins. And I think we will. They're great workers, tremendous workers. I think they'll have great matches, a great match. There's no doubt in my mind the match between these two will be great. Uh, but if the finish is just laughable or bad or doesn't make any sense or just, just looks terrible the way they've done it, that's all the match will be remembered for is the terrible finish. So they are very much on a knife edge when it comes to this one in terms of the quality because they could do so much great work and then they could get right to the finish and it could be bad. It could be really bad. And let's be honest, if this was real life and you ripped the eye out of someone, I'm expecting blood. I'm expecting, you know, you want it to be graphic. You've called it the, it the horror show at Extreme Rules. Let's do something horrific. Let's do something out there. I don't think WWE will because it's PG. Um... I do find irony that last year Vince Mann called AW a blood and guts company and then fast forward a year later and we're ripping eyeballs out of someone's head. I'm, that's pretty worse than uh, cutting yourself to add a bit of drama to the match for me. You know, what's worse, thumbtacks or, thumb or having your eye ripped out? I know which one I think is worse when it comes to that one. Um, in terms of a prediction for winning this one, <laughs> who's going to be without an eye? This is the this is the ludicrous thing. Before I get into prediction, this is the crazy thing: is that losing an eye is permanent. So even if both of these guys, so Rey Mysterio, there's rumours about his contract expiring, but both of them, they're go. If even if they both stay with WWE for the rest of their WWE run, for the rest of their WWE career, they have to either wear a contact lens to imply that they have a glass eye in. They have to either wear an eye patch because they've got one eye. Or just, I don't know how they would do it. So this is very permanent. This is why I don't understand this one. In the realm of sports entertainment, where someone that you could hate, you could tag team with about three weeks later, losing an eye seems very permanent to me. And just permanent in pro wrestling just doesn't exist. So again, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated to see how they do it, if it works or if it doesn't work. I'm going to hold reservation until I see it. Um... But it does make me chuckle every time I hear that stipulation. In terms of prediction, I think Seth Rollins wins this one purely because, look, Rey Mysterio, he's on a, a handshake deal with WWE right now. His contract has expired. Uh, there is optimism that Rey Mysterio is going to re-sign with WWE. They're thinking that uh, the reason that Rey Mysterio will re-sign with WWE is due to the status of his son Dominic with the company. If Rey signs, it's likely that Dominic will get his uh, big break in WWE, maybe go to NXT or uh, at least team with Rey Mysterio. But Rey Mysterio has options. He can go to an AEW. He can go to an Impact Wrestling. Um, he 
you can potentially go to the Japan once those travel restrictions start to ease up. Um, he asked for more money from WWE. They said no, because at the time they were releasing talent and not interested in giving pay raises, which I understand. That is that is understandable. Uh, but I think it's in WWE's best interest to keep Rey Mysterio as they're still building uh, new Hispanic stars like an Andrade, like an Angel Garza, who I do think eventually can take Mysterio's pl- uh, place there. But they still need Rey Mysterio and having Rey Mysterio on a raw show that desperately needs stars is is a must for me. So I think they do need to make sure that they do re-sign him. Although as far as this match, I think Seth Rollins wins purely because, as I mentioned, Rey Mysterio's uh, could potentially be leaving WWE, even though I don't think he will. But also just the post-management of the eye thing, um, for me, makes it a lot easier. We've seen Rey Mysterio with the mask, with like an eye patch thing over it. I think he would just have another one of those. Whereas Seth Rollins loses uh, and has to pretend he's wearing a glass eye, that pretty much means he has to wear a contact, I would say, in one of his eyes every single week. Uh, and have like a different colored eye. I'm thinking like the Thor in Avengers Infinity War kind of deal where he has one normal colored eye and one like orange brown colored eye. The brown one is his fake eye. They just wear a contact in there to basically imply that that's a fake eye. I think that's what they would do with Seth Rollins in that situation. Uh, but Rey Mysterio, they can just put the eye patch over the mask, which is what they've been doing recently anyway. So uh, I think Seth Rollins will leave this one with both, his, uh, both of his eyes and Rey Mysterio with only one, even though Rey Mysterio was the one to challenge Seth Rollins and Rey Mysterio was the one to nearly lose his eye in the first place. He could lose the other one. Next, we have the SmackDown Women's Championship on the line. We have Bailey defending the SmackDown Women's Championship against Nikki Cross. This is a, a, a strange one for me because the last two weeks on SmackDown, we have seen uh, Bailey defeat Nikki Cross in various forms of tag team matches. A couple of weeks ago, it was Bailey and Sasha Banks versus Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. This past week on SmackDown, it was Bailey and Sasha Banks versus Nikki Cross and Asuka. Uh, each time, Bailey pins Nikki Cross. And after the match, we saw Nikki Cross backstage. She looked frustrated. She was talking to Alexa Bliss. She was saying, that she doesn't want to fail, that this Sunday was her moment. She tr- obviously moved all the way from Scotland for this. People are watching. They, she doesn't want to watch her lose all the time. And uh, and then attacked Bailey backstage. Now, some people said, oh, is this going to be uh, a bit of an evolution of Nikki Cross's character? She's going to go back to the crazy, wild character. I don't think so. Nikki Cross is still very much a wild character obviously not as crazy as she was in NXT uh, but I don't think she'll to be honest she'll probably ever go back to that kind of character on Raw and Smackdown because that's how the creative teams and Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard like to present Nikki Cross so I don't think that's the case what I do think it could mean is that we are going to see Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss split up very very soon Nikki Cross openly spoke about how she doesn't get the opportunities that Alexa Bliss gets. This is a huge opportunity for her and she's got to make it count. Uh, And Alexa Bliss sort of tried to say, oh, that's not true, that's not true. But to me, that kind of implies that seeds are planted uh, for Bliss Cross to be splitting up soon. Um, To be honest, I don't don't think that they should. I don't see why they should. the SmackDown Women's Championship feud going forward will be Bailey versus Sasha Banks. That's what we know we're going to get to. Um, the SmackDown Women's Tag Team Division needs tag teams. Um, obviously, we've seen Bliss and Cross be tag team champions a couple of times now, but they need constant established tag teams in there. If they split up, realistically, what are they going to do? I don't know. I don't know. I don't see how... Um, Alexa Bliss will fit into the SmackDown Women's Championship picture because I think Alexa Bliss will be the one to turn on Nikki Cross. I think she'll go back to her original old Alexa Bliss character, the sort of the goddess, but the heel goddess. Remember when uh, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross first became a tag team, there was all the speculation on WWE television. When is she going to turn on Nikki Cross? Is she genuine? Is she a real friend? Because... Alexa Bliss has been best friends with like three people in WWE so far, whether it's Nia Jax, Mickey James, or now Nikki Cross, and it never tends to go well. Uh, so a lot of people were saying, you can't trust Alexa Bliss. When are they, when is she eventually going to turn on her? And she never did, and they became a great tag team, and Alexa Bliss has done pretty good as a babyface. I don't think her work is as good as she, when she's a heel, uh, but she's done a pretty good job as a babyface. But I think Alexa Bliss is going to cost Nikki Cross the match here. My prediction is is that Nikki Cross is going to have this match won. She's going to finally be close to achieving her dreams, and then what do you know? 
Alexa Bliss is the one to cost her. Uh, and then potentially we have a feud between Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross going forward on SmackDown. So I think that's what we're going to get. I think Bailey retains. Uh, and then eventually we're going to get Bailey versus Sasha Banks anyway. But in this one, I think Bailey retains. And I think we're going to have the. Um, uh, the team of Bliss Cross dissolving in front of our very eyes. Next up, we have the Raw Women's Championship match. Asuka defends her Raw Women's Championship against Sasha Banks. Of course, Sasha Banks being a SmackDown superstar, but being one half of the WWE Women's Tag Team Champion, she can appear on both Raw and SmackDown, which I guess makes her eligible to challenge for Asuka's Raw Women's Championship, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's me sort of trying to add some logic to this one. Um, I'm really looking forward to this match. I think, uh, regardless of all the matches that are on the card, I think this is going to be the match of the show. We've seen that Asuka and Sasha Banks' chemistry recently on Raw and on SmackDown this past Friday is really, really, really good. Um, we spoke about Bailey a second ago, but Asuka, Sasha Banks, and Bailey in this pandemic era have been the MVPs for me. I think if you look at who's had the best years in, year in WWE so far and look at it, um, as just who's done the best. You have Randy Orton for me, who has been, even before the pandemic era, was just brilliant. And has been brilliant ever since that. This heel run of Randy Orton has just been sensational. I, I, honestly, I don't think you can overstate how good he's been. But once you start getting into the pandemic era and the empty arena shows and then the performance center shows, I think Asuka was, without a shadow of a doubt, the MVP of the empty arena shows. She was just phenomenal and that's the reason that she's the Raw Women's Champion right now. And then fast forward into these uh, performance center shows but with the um, NXT Performance Center recruits as the audience, I think Bailey and Sasha Banks have been the MVPs. They're on every single show. They're on Raw, they're on SmackDown, they're on NXT. They're constantly entertaining. Every segment's a must-see. Their promos are great. Their character is great the Bailey versus Sasha Banks match we know is going to happen in the future but I don't want to see it happen for a long time I want them to still stretch this story out because there's so much meat on the bone when it comes to this story there is so much they can still do uh, with this Bailey and Sasha Banks feud that I don't want to see it at uh, SummerSlam I don't think we need to see it at SummerSlam I think that WWE truly can stretch this out until WrestleMania next year I think this match deserves an arena it deserves a stadium Will we have fans in a stadium next year? Who knows? Will we have fans in the arenas next year? Who knows? Uh, but I think this story between Sasha Banks and Bailey can be stretched out for a long time. So hopefully we don't get the split between them soon. Uh, as I mentioned, though, this match I think is going to be the match of the night. It's the match that, in terms of match quality, I'm looking forward to the most. I'm looking forward to the eye for an eye match and the Wyatt Swamp fight just because they're so unique and just can WWE pull it off and um, the rubberneck effect. I mentioned quite a lot on this channel of... Is it going to be so bad that I can't turn away or is it going to be good? In terms of an actual match, in terms of a, a match inside the wrestling ring, there's no gimmicks on this one. It's just a singles match. Asuka versus Sasha Banks, to me, will be the match of the night and will be uh, the match in terms of match quality that people will be talking about. I've said for a couple of weeks now that I think Asuka versus Sasha Banks should be the main event for the show because I genuinely think it's the best match of the show. Factor in also, it's uh, the celebrated five years of the women's evolution this week in WWE. Sasha Banks being one of those names that debuted on Raw uh, back in 2015. Surely the way to celebrate it is to have a female main event of this pay-per-view. And I think Asuka versus Sasha Banks would be a perfect way to have uh, that main event. I think the match quality would just be perfect. And I think it would be a match fitting for the main event of the show. Now, ultimately, I don't think it will be the main event, unfortunately. I think that's probably going to be uh, the Wyatt Swamp fight or the WWE Championship match. But um, I think it should be the main event, considering the circumstances that we're in right now in terms of the celebration of the women's evolution and people clamoring for an Evolution 2 pay-per-view. Why not? Why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you have uh, Asuka versus Sasha Banks be the main event? In terms of a prediction... I think Asuka retains here. I'd be very, very surprised if Sasha Banks won this one. Look, I'd be really behind the idea of having Sasha Banks and Bailey hold all the championships in WWE because I think that would be the peak. And the thing is, once you reach peaks, is the only way to go is down. And um, that could slowly begin teasing uh, 
the breakup of Sasha Banks and Bailey. However, I don't think that they'll do this. I think they'll stick with Asuka as the Raw Women's Champion, as they should. They need to continue building her as the top babyface female on the Raw brand with the absence of Becky Lynch. Uh, and she should get the same treatment as Becky Lynch. She should win, 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 and continue winning. She's still got the uh, the will of the people. And if we were in arenas right now with fans, they would be cheering her, no doubt. Um, so I think Asuka retains here. But I think the most important thing here is going to be the match itself. I think it's going to be an absolutely tremendous match. So next up, we have the WWE Championship match. We have Drew McIntyre defending against his former friend, Dolph Ziggler. Uh, we don't know the stipulation of this one. Drew McIntyre said that Dolph Ziggler could name the stipulation for this match. Uh, but as of yet, it's yet to be announced. So Dolph Ziggler is most likely going to reveal the stipulation for this match just before the match itself takes place. Now, spoilers ahead because this might be the actual reveal of the stipulation. It had been uh, floating around on social media that WWE had actually spoiled this. There were Facebook ads for the Horror Show at Extreme Rules event of the WWE Championship match uh, that said that this match could be a tables, ladders and chairs match for the WWE Championship. Whether or not that is the case or whether it was just a placeholder advert or maybe that was just an old creative plan, we'll have to wait and see uh, for that one. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the case. Um, in terms of this match, look, I don't think there's much to discuss here. Dolph Ziggler versus Drew McIntyre, great, but it just feels like... Look, the match itself is going to be fine. The match itself is going to be great. Both guys can work. Without question, Drew McIntyre can work. And without question, obviously, Dolph Ziggler can work. We're stuck in this position once again where they don't have a challenger for the WWE Championship, so they throw Dolph Ziggler in here. I know they, he has history with Drew McIntyre, but that's essentially what it is. Oh, we don't have anyone throwing Dolph as a placeholder feud. There's no way Dolph Ziggler's going to win, is there? He just isn't going to be WWE Champion. I know we've had The Rock... On Instagram, say, oh, I'd co-sign this of having Dolph Ziggler as the WWE Champion. But I don't think the audience would. I don't think the audience would. Look, we had 1.5 million viewers tune in for Raw Monday night. I'm not saying that's because of Dolph Ziggler facing Drew McIntyre. But he's not exactly going to drive up the ratings if he is WWE Champion or anything like that. The match itself is going to be fine. Um, but it's obvious that Drew McIntyre is going to retain here. The rumour is that Drew McIntyre will go on to SummerSlam to face Randy Orton. Now that is a money match. That is a match that's difficult to predict and not a lot of people will be able to tell who is going to win it. That is a match that I'm looking forward to and I really want to see. And they had great chemistry early on in the year. Randy Orton and Drew, McIn and Drew, Mc Drew McIntyre, easy for me to say, when they were facing off on Raw. So that's a money match. This one... Yeah, it'll be fine. If it is a TLC match, we'll have some great spots. It'll look great. I'm sure they'll put on a show, and I'm sure they want to prove people wrong. But Drew McIntyre's retaining the WWE Championship here. Enough said. I mean, and there's not much really more to discuss about it, I think. Um, it's not. We can't even have the conversation of, oh, what if Dolph Ziggler wins? Because he won't. He, he just won't. And finally, what I think will most likely be our main event of the evening, we have WWE Universal Champion Braun Strowman going up against Bray Wyatt in a Wyatt Swamp Fight. Yes, a white swamp fight. It isn't for the WWE Universal Championship. It is um, it is a non-title match and it has been uh, already recorded as, as of this time. There was a bit of delay in getting it recorded. Uh, but as of, I'm just looking at the date now, uh, as of... Uh, July 16th, the Wyatt Swamp fight was recorded and it has been successfully recorded there. Interesting fact about Bray Wyatt recently, uh, of course, is that Bray Wyatt just hasn't been in the WWE Performance Center. He's got uh, a newborn child at home. Uh, and he's doing all of his recordings of the Firefly Funhouse and all of those promos, etc. They have been... Um, they have been recorded at home because he doesn't feel safe going to the Performance Center. Masks and or not, testing or not, social distancing or not. After getting close to possibly more now, 40 positive COVID tests, look, he's got small children at home, he's got a newborn child at home, it's just not worth it for him. But WWE, of course, are looking to accommodate um, Bray Wyatt, and he's just been cutting the promos at home. Does he need to be in the performance centre? No, he doesn't, um, but uh, he's just not been there. And even with this, uh, with them pre-recording the Wyatt Swamp fight, um, by all accounts, there are a lot and a lot of precautions uh, that went into this one. Again, a bit like with the eye for an eye situation. Interested to see what they pull off here. I think the build for this one, at first I was sceptical. 
But I think it's probably Braun Strowman's best work that he's done as uh, Universal Champion. I think the last two weeks or so on SmackDown, I think his promos have been very good. His promos are always okay. I think he talks quite quickly, and that's even I'm saying that, and I talk very quickly. Uh, but I think the last few weeks he's been pretty good on uh, on SmackDown. I think it's probably been his best booking so far as Universal Champion, uh, as his Universal Championship reign so far has been pretty underwhelming, especially considering that. You look back on it, his victory over Goldberg at WrestleMania, he was thrown in at the last minute for no rhyme or reason. It didn't feel like it was the right time. It felt like the they'd missed the boat when it comes to Braun Strowman. But the last few weeks, I think he is starting to turn a few heads as Universal Champion, which is interesting to see. I still don't think he should have won it at WrestleMania. I think that would have been a better spot for someone like Jeff Hardy. Um, but Braun Strowman got the nod there. Uh, so I think he's done good work recently. The Bray Wyatt Eater of Worlds character... You know, it's not my favorite Bray Wyatt character. I prefer the Firefly Funhouse and the Fiend. Um, I was a fan of the initially a fan of the of the Eater of Worlds character in NXT when they first came to WWE. I think towards the end of that run in WWE, it just felt so convoluted and so. The promos at that point towards the end just did not make any sense. They were so rambling, and coming out of it, you had no idea what he had just said, and just felt like. I don't know. It just it just felt like was was that a promo? Because I don't think I don't feel the story has progressed at all here. Uh, and we had a promo that he cut on SmackDown on Friday, which gave me a bit of flashbacks to that. But it was actually okay. It was all about uh, Braun Strowman, and this is the the, the storyline, isn't it? Here, of course. Now they had the match at Money in the Bank, and that was Firefly Funhouse Bray versus Braun Strowman, and it was all about uh, Bray trying to get Braun Strowman to come home and wear the black sheep mask because of course Bray Wyatt used to be the leader of Braun Strowman in the Wyatt family brought Braun Strowman to WWE um, and then Braun Strowman convincingly beats Bray Wyatt at Money in the Bank and everyone thinks that's that Bray Wyatt disappears for a month or so to have his child uh, the birth of his child uh, and now he's back in a different form back in the Each of Worlds character the original character that brought in Braun Strowman uh, and challenges him uh, once again to a match Braun Strowman says to end this, they need to go home. And that being the swamp, by all accounts, this is the swamp in which Braun Strowman initially met Bray Wyatt and had the snake bite him in the face repeatedly and laughed. you remember that promo? So that's what we're doing. We're going home, as they would put it, and uh, uh, we're going to have the Wyatt Swamp fight. It's obviously going to be shot cinematic style, so it should be good. I think it's going to be weird. It's going to be out there. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Prediction-wise, I think Braun Strowman is going to win this one. The reason I say that is I think the storyline that they're going for here is to have uh, the only person that can beat Braun Strowman is The Fiend, and that leads to the return of The Fiend. I think we're going to have Firefly Funhouse Bray lose to Braun Strowman. I think we're going to have Eater of Worlds Bray lose to Braun Strowman. Uh, and then the only thing that Bray can do to finally defeat Braun and bring back the Universal Championship is bring back the fiend himself. So I think that's exactly what is going to happen. So I think Braun Strowman is going to win this one. Braun Strowman has even said uh, on SmackDown Friday, he referenced about, um, I have to beat him because this is the only way to stop the fiend from appearing. And the fiend is all the worst parts of me and the worst parts of Bray also. Uh, so you can already tell that Braun Strowman actually fears the fiend. And that's the storyline they can do after this. That can be the next chapter of this storyline being, uh, that the fiend is the one person that Braun Strowman truly fears. He doesn't fear any other p person or human being on earth, but he does fear the fiend. I think that's where they're going to go with it. Um, people are saying, what about Otis? Could Otis cash in the money in the bank here? Look, where is Otis? <laughs> I think that's the question. Where Where is Otis? We don't know. I don't know. Since we're in the money in the bank, he's largely disappeared. It's He's falling into that trap, isn't he, of because you've won the money in the bank, you just your career nosedives until you might win the title. We saw it with... Damien Sandow, Baron Corbin. Um, we've seen it with a couple of people now that they win the money in the bank and it just it just doesn't mean anything and it's just uh, pointless and they give up on it. So we'll have to wait and see a vote. But I don't think he cashes in here. I don't think that would lend so much. And I talked about Braun Strowman potentially not being ready for the Universal Championship. I don't think Otis is. Look, I'm a big fan of the Otis character. I think it's quite a lot of fun. I would, I'm would. i not sure if I would have considered it to be worthy of the Universal Championship or is it Universal Championship caliber gimmick? But that's what WWE wanted to go with or considered to go with. The issue is, is that um, uh, I don't think this is the place to do it and I don't think Otis is ready. If anything, Otis should be the person to hold it for close to a year and see where he is in a year. If it doesn't work then, then you can have him lose or if he has got over then you can... Um, 
you can have him win the title then. The problem is you do have to actually use him on television and they're not using him at all. So even if it got to a year later, he might not even be as over as he once was because he's not being used at all. So it's a difficult one there. Uh, but in terms of the prediction for this one, I think that Braun Strowman is going to win, stand tall, but I also think we're going to have an appearance of The Fiend and that's how I think we're going to go off the air. I think Braun Strowman defeats the, uh, this version of Bray Wyatt, the Eater of Worlds version of Bray Wyatt, but I think it leads to an appearance of The Fiend, which sets up their future show. So there we have the predictions and preview for Extreme Rules 2020, the horror show at Extreme Rules 2020. What are your thoughts? What are your predictions? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I'll be sure to interact with all of you guys down there. I really enjoy interacting and chatting with you guys in the comment section. Don't forget, we will be doing a watch along for Extreme Rules uh, tonight on the YouTube channel. We'll be putting a, I'll put a link in the description box below about uh, the link to that. And we'll also set up the stream for that. Uh, and I'll be posting it on a Twitter account also. So be sure to join us then to have a bit of chat, talk about wrestling talk about what's going on on the screen it might even be more entertaining than the horror show at extreme rules itself so be sure to give us a join there be sure to give us a like on this video and share it with your friends too and also subscribe to wrestling news 365 you can do that by clicking the bottom right hand corner of the screen right now or if you wait a few seconds there'll be a subscribe button at the end of this video along with another video for you to watch we're very very close to 500 subscribers now so uh please 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 do subscribe if you haven't subscribed already and uh, we can hit our 500 subscriber goal on the long road to the 1000 subscriber aim uh, once we get to 1000 subscribers we'll be doing a lot more content here on the channel whether it is live streams watch longs uh playing games you name it we'll we'll do it on here it makes it a lot easier once we get to that 1000 subscriber mark so really appreciate everyone that has subscribed already and if you haven't uh please do so uh be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms on the screen right now also it's at 365 wrestle on twitter and at wrestle news 365 on facebook and instagram thank you very much for watching listening streaming or however you come across this video today and i'll speak for you again very very soon Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.